all the passages we read from St. Luke's Gospel, this is perhaps one of the most complex. It doesn't follow his normal form. Now, in, in looking at Luke, Luke was an educated person. He wrote in very classic high Greek. And so it's not that he, you know, just kind of said, well, I'll throw this story together that Jesus said and, and move on. That he was probably just as perplexed as what happened here. Uh, a number of things that need to be pointed out, but first, just to really think about something that all these readings seem to have in common. We always search out a glimmer of hope. We really do. We try to eke out even the least bit of hope. We're like the uh, proverbial little girl who dove into the pile of manure because she said there's a pony in here somewhere. You know, she just sees the glimmer of hope. When we go and we perhaps get a diagnosis which is bad, the first thing we look for is the hope from the physician saying, oh yeah, but, but your percentages are good here or the, the chances you'll recover are good. And, and even when they give a bleak uh, prognosis that you know there's, there's no hope, we just keep pushing the issue. But what if this or what if that? We're looking for this little glimmer of hope. Even when we're dealing with people, if we're trying to bargain at the very least, we're looking for a glimmer of hope. In the first reading, so they're going against the Amalekites in this big war, and Moses is holding up his arms, that gives him a glimmer of hope. And even when he gets tired, and he has Aaron on one side and her on the other, and they're holding up his arms, they don't care about that. They could obviously see those guys holding up his arms. It gave them the glimmer of hope that they needed in order to defeat this army. But hope is no good without faith. If we don't have faith, we're not going to have hope. Because faith helps us to see what our eyes do not, or to hear what we cannot. It believes something that's not necessarily uh, open to the senses. And if we have that faith, then we can have even the least glimmer of hope, especially in those times when we need it most. And so we jump from there up here to the gospel. This is one of the only parables that Jesus introduces and says, listen, here's the lesson that you're going to get from this. He doesn't do this with many of the other parables. Now, he's setting himself up here by doing that because he's either putting, you know, in front of them this expectation that might not be met or they're just going to turn him off. Okay, he just told us what the lesson is. We don't even have to listen to the story. But he goes through and he says, here is a... The, a, a parable about the necessity to pray always. Now, if he didn't give us that little introduction, we might think that he's comparing God to this unjust judge who will finally give in because we've pestered him enough. And that's not nearly what he's doing here. He talks about someone who doesn't fear God nor respects any human being. So in Luke's gospel, when he says that, what he's essentially saying is, this is a bad guy. This is kind of a worthless judge. He's not even doing what he's supposed to. Because we want someone who respects human beings and certainly someone who fears God. Thus enters the widow. Now in the ancient world, the rule was you had to take care of widows and orphans. That was not only in the, the law according to the, the Jews, it was in civil law too. Roman law said that as well. So obviously this woman is not being cared for and she has some kind of adversarial relationship going on. So this judge is not giving her what she's due. Now let's you know, distinguish between what she wants or what she's due. What we're due is something that by our very nature we should have, as opposed to something that we just want. And so here is this just woman. She's trying to receive what she deserves. No more, no less, just what she deserves. So the judge has this soliloquy with himself, and he's sitting here in this monologue and he says, although I neither fear God nor respect man, I'm gonna give this lady her judgment because she's pestering me so much. And the last phrase is a little strange. Uh, we, we take it literally in the English translation where he says, uh, I'm gonna give her a, a, her just decision lest she finally come and strike me. The Greek, if you go back to the Greek gospel, it says, 
lest she blacken my eye. Now we might think, oh, give him a black eye. And that's how it's been translated here. But blackening one's eye is an idiom. It means ruining their reputation. It means besmirching them, going around telling people how unjust this person is. So now we find out that although this man may not fear God, he does at least care what people think. He's a politician, to say the least. He wants to make sure that he can remain in his position as judge. And because he wants to protect himself in that way, he gives her the decision. Again, even here though, we see the glimmer of hope that this widow would not have kept pestering and pestering unless she saw a glimmer of hope that maybe, okay, today is the day he'll change his mind. And I would like to think even that she might have seen a glimmer of hope that he could change. That maybe someday he might actually, if not fear God, at least acknowledge him. That if he didn't respect people, at least he would give a just judgment when he was called to do that. I think this speaks to us in a special way because we want so many people to be here with us at the Mass, especially our loved ones, maybe our loved ones who have gone away from the church. And that creates a lot of angst in us, it creates pain, because we want them here with us. And we have tried probably any number of ways in order to get them back to church. Everything from inviting them over when they're trapped at our house for a week or so, any way from uh, kind of getting them to come to a baptism or a wedding or even a funeral that we try to get them back to church. And I think our Holy Father is giving us a great model of this. Never before have I heard so many people say, I'm thinking about coming back to the church now. Now they might be coming back for the wrong reasons at this point, but to their surprise, they're gonna find out that the rules haven't changed too much since they left. The fact is, we're getting them in the door. And that can be done in any number of ways. I think once we get them in the door, that's the first step. And so this widow goes to him, and he's worried that he's gonna, she's gonna besmirch his reputation, so he gives in. She doesn't care. He gave in. She got her just decision. That's all she wanted. And so when we're looking at bringing our loved ones back to the church, I'm not saying that we go out and tell them things that aren't true. But I say, as Jesus says, we be clever as serpents and innocent as doves. That in different ways where our nagging might not have worked or our threats of eternal hellfire might not have worked so well, that we find other ways to invite them back. On the other end of that, unlike the widow, I would suggest that we don't nag them that we don't continue to badger them in order to break them down so they finally give in, because then they're just kind of doing it to shut us up. But that we give them reasons that they can see within our own life and the way we live our life. And I think a primary way we do that is to show them that we are a people of hope. And in order to be a people of hope, we must first have faith. It's interesting in my own life, uh, when I first began in the seminary and the like, uh, I had a nephew that was born. And at that point, they weren't really going to church at all, but I became his godfather. And so I would call my sister and I would say, listen, get him ready because I'm gonna take him to mass tonight. So I might finish a day at the parish and then I would go and pick him up and take him to mass myself. Imagine how weird it was sitting out there in the congregation, you know, and looking up at the priest. But I did that for about three months, and then I remember calling her house at the one point, and I said, I'm, I'm gonna go pick him up, uh, just make sure he's ready, and she said, we're taking him tonight. And ever since then, they've been very faithful, very involved in the church. That it took an act on my part, not nagging or preaching or anything else, just saying, I'm willing to take that responsibility, it's that important, and that they saw that they followed suit. If we are going to be a people of hope, then we also have to see that glimmer of hope even among those who have gone the farthest from the church. And if we have faith, then we can easily answer the question in Luke's Gospel, that even if we have faith, that the Lord will not come to return one day and find that there is no faith on earth. 
something that we will begin today. And just as an added note, you know, with different things going on in the world today, uh, certainly a threat on the dignity of all human life, we've decided to pray at the end of Mass the St. Michael the Archangel prayer. We know that tradition holds that St. Michael was the angel that threw Lucifer out of heaven. And so we pray for his continued protection, for respect for the dignity of all human life, from a natural birth to a natural end and everything in between.